That's lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Christine. Appreciate it. I want to say thank you very much too for the invitation to talk to you, uh, to Murray, to Joe, and to Ricardo. Really do appreciate the opportunity and uh, greatly regret not being with you in person. Also share Murray's sense of loss uh, at Thomas Art's departure from us um, because he was such a great voice speaking out for the German classical tradition. Um, and he was a great promoter of that tradition. So he, he is a very, very sad loss. Um, and I'd like to start just with a quick confession. When I was at Eranos, at the kind invitation of the good people there a couple of years ago, I couldn't help it. I picked up a stone from the beach. I kept the stone in the office till we had to leave the office in the pandemic. And so I've got the little stone here. I'm going to put it behind me there. And I hope it'll work a little bit of Eranos magic as I speak to you all. So my starting point is what is reality and what is uh, fantasy? And a little bit of popular culture to get us going. In the American TV series, Mr. Robot, Elliot Alderson's recruited by a mysterious figure called Mr. Robot into an anarchist group that works to cancel the entire global debt by attacking a massive con conglomerate called Equal. And in season one, episode nine, there's a moment of great dramatic tension when Elliot accuses Mr. Robot, you're not real. And he receives the following rhetorical outburst in response. Is any of it real? I mean, look at this, look at it. A world built on fantasy. Synthetic emotions in the form of pills, psychological warfare in the form of advertising, mind-altering chemicals in the form of food, brainwashing seminars in the form of media, controlled, isolated bubbles in the form of social networks. Real? You want to talk about reality? We haven't lived in anything remotely close to it since the turn of the century. And I suppose thinking about what is real and what is fantasy is a bit like this experience at the, the moment, which is very strange for me, um, speaking to you all here in Scotland, and you looking up at me like some kind of big brother. So reality and fantasy is very much part of what we're going through at the, at the moment. Speaking of real and speaking of what is fantastic, it seems to me that this is what links crucially to what the Red Book is about and why it is a book for our times. And I'm, I'm delighted to, to get a repeat invite to, to contribute to the excellent series that, uh, that was begun by, by Thomas and, and Murray. Because I think it is a book for our time, which is, I think we'd all agree, a very strange time. And that's why it's a very strange book, or at least a work sui generis. And we remember RFC Hull's reaction to the Red Book as William Maguire recorded it. He says, oh my God, it's a book full of really mad drawings with commentaries and monkish script. I'm not surprised young kids had under lock and key. Talk about Freud's self-analysis, Jung is a walking asylum in himself. But the point that I want to make is that it's not a work without antecedents. Obviously, it is modelled on medieval manuscripts. It's a kind of grimoire. Critics such as Susan Thackeray have pointed to intriguing parallels in terms of the visual aesthetic in the Red Book and contemporary artists. 
I've tried to draw attention to the structural parallels in terms of the narrative between the Red Book and the epic tradition in German literature. And that's a project which I'm hoping to take forward um, uh, with the support of people who might be in the audience at the moment uh, uh, in the very near future. And of course, there is the relation to Nietzsche's thus spoke Zarathustra. And I think it's significant that we've already touched on Zarathustra twice in Romano uh, Madeira's talk uh, and my uh, uh, attempt to intervene, um, uh, and in Christine Maillard's uh, paper earlier today. And I was just going to say, Christine, in terms of the question, how do we translate Ubermensch? The Ubermensch is the man who drives the cheap taxi. Well, I'm not going to pursue uh, in too much detail Zarathustra at the moment. What I want to make the point is that these parallels seem to me strengthen the significance of the Red Book because we can see its position within a tradition. Sure, on one level, the Red Book emerges from Jung's unconscious, or indeed the collective unconscious, but on another, it emerges within a particular historical cultural context. And I think that appreciating its position within this context will lead to a greater appreciation of what Jung achieved in the Red Book, but whatever one decides that that achievement may have been. So today, what I want to suggest is that while, while Jung's Red Book is clearly a very strange work, it is in some respects not that strange. If the Red Book is an expression of Jung's search for the soul, he had some fellow searches for it, albeit some possibly unexpected ones. And so I want to consider two parallel figures, very different figures, Ludwig Klages's visions in Rhythmen und Runen, published in 44, but containing material that dates back as 1889 and 1890, and uh, the dream protocols of Theodor V. Adorno. And um, uh, whatever you might think of the title of my paper, I hope you'd agree that it's pretty rare that you see those three names, Jung, Klages, and Adorno, all brought together. So I'll start with uh, Ludwig Klages. Uh, the man from over the water, we might say, uh, because he lived in uh, uh, Kilchberg, just uh, on the other side of the lake from Kusnacht. Uh, he and, and Jung would have been able to wave at each other, perhaps, um, or maybe rub shoulders down at Miko or Co-op uh, on a Saturday morning. But otherwise, they had very little to do with each other. And it's, it's interesting. It's a kind of missed encounter, one might say. Uh, Ludwig Klages has been described as an uncomfortable thinker. Um, he's certainly a very unpopular thinker. Um, born in Hanover in 1872, so about two and a half years before Jung, um, and then at a school by the Lyceum on the Georgsplatz, Klages demonstrated extraordinary intellectual curiosity, remarkable powers of imagination. When he was about 15 years old, he began writing poetry, influenced by the great epics of the Edda and Beowulf, and as well as the Stabrein of Wilhelm Jordan. Um, and I think Jordan is an interesting figure that Jung talks about in psychological times. Because he was forbidden to write poetry, he would write these verses secretly in his vocabulary notebooks for ancient Greek in the days when you taught languages by having vocabulary notebooks. And he began to develop a comprehensive system that would encompass both Greek and Germanic mythology. So huge great interest in mythology, and again, obviously, like Jung, in that regard. In fact, in the estimation of Klages' biographer, Hans Egert Schröder, he talks about the same immense ability to absorb material remaining with Klages throughout his life. He says that it enabled him, with a Goethean thoroughness, to take notice of new publications across the most diverse disciplines far beyond the concern with subject-specific literature necessary for his writings, so that friends who drew his attention for a completely unknown work of a most abstruse area experienced time and again he'd long known about it and was intimately familiar with it. 
that one could perhaps with Clargis, as has been done with Jung, say that he was writing a biography in books. Well, while an adult, Clargis suffered from um, insomnia, but as a boy, he slept deeply, very deeply, as well as um, being a somnambulist and on several occasions having out-of-the-body experiences. And, and with, as a boy, his first erotic awakenings, Clargus became aware not just of their comical aspect, as he calls them, but also of mystical depth of experience. Eine mystische Tiefe des Erlebens. And, and this tension between comedy and depth, I think that's something that we find as well with Jung. I think that Jung was capable of being hugely ironic I think there's an ironic side to Clarkus as, as well. The sense of mystical depth, as well as a kind of sense of comedy, is evident in the early prose and poetry texts of Clarkus, and that were occluded by him in his own Nachlass publication, Rhythmen und Brunnen. And it says something about the state of Clarkus' reception that he realized in his own lifetime that if he was going to have his Nachlass organized, he was going to have to do it himself. He talks about the unusual experiences that he had when he was composing. Um, he talks about, and again, he, he writes about himself in third person, much as, as Goethe does, um, uh, as uh, finding himself alone, walking up and down in his room while composing. Well, he suddenly found himself surrounded on eye level by a bright blood red stripe about 10 centimeters diameter. It was not a circle on her lips but a formation that had become a kind of flux constantly moving. If you focused on this following strip, it vanished, but it became very clearly visible again as soon as the condition of composing, of being composed, began again. And I think this, this for me reminds me of the extraordinary experience that Goethe has when he says, he, he talks about seeing plants flowering before his eyes, and it's Jung who draws attention to this passage um, uh, when he writes his thesis about occult phenomena. In Klager's his own estimation, these experiences and others marked his formative years for what they were. And in his autobiographical notes, he speaks of himself as walking as if in a permanent blood ring of dreams in which the blows and knocks of everyday life painly but vainly throbbed. He talks about pouring his interior fullness into poetic choruses of entirely dispersed voices from horizons of the primordial world. And it's this sense of the primordial, I think, which brings him so very, very close to Jung. We think, for example, of that passage called, um, in the chapter called The Three Prophecies, in which Jung's soul dives down into the floods and returns up with the flotsam and jetsam from past cultures, the treasures of all past cultures, we read. Magnificent images of gods, spacious temples, paintings, papyrus rolls, a primordial world, but which has not gone. It's still there and we can access it in some way. This sense of a mystical depth of experiencing is true um, of his early years in, in general. And in his Nachlass, Rhythmen und Runen, so Rhythms and Runes, we find a collection of these texts. And they demonstrate, I think, uh, the following three categories. First of all, it show Clarkers as living in a kind of dream world, a world that proves to be stronger than waking consciousness, perhaps a bit like these visionary experiences that Jung has when he's working on the black box and the red box. Second, they reveal a certain preference for landscapes, or one might say soulscapes, as opposed to human society. So it's all about the setting as being a kind of existential platform. And third, they show Clarkus as filled with images of a primordial age, almost as it were overwhelmed by the reawakening of primal memories. And I wanted to share with you, whilst keeping an eye on the time, just to give you a sense of the flavor of it, um, a few extracts from a poem written by Clarges in 1890 called In Winter. And this is my best attempt at a, a translation of them. I trod alone the silent path, 
my coat tight wrapped around me. From north, I heard the wind complaining through the dry twigs. The grey spirit of mist lay darkening across the field and held in its icy breath the nocturnal world within its grasp. No bird swooping through the air, no tiny star as a light, no leaf blowing in the branches, no sound penetrates the night. And yet, as we'll see, amid this frosty silence, the poetic ego senses that new life is about to break forth. Through the night came gleaming brighter the hot resplendence of life. This announces, I cried out, jubilant the future's new awakening. High above me rang out a sound like the shrill of laughter of spirits. A gust of wind blew and shivering, I drew my cloak around me and closer yet, the raw hand of winter drew back the white dress around me. But I went on, comforted. One thing has remained with me. And even if the spring should ne'er arise with thrives as young as May, and if there were eternally only snow, ice, mist, and dark. One thing remains like, deep in snow, the green shimmer of the pine. It lights a life that is exhausted like a red fiery drink and entwines something eternally green around the ice. Memory. And the word memory there is in German, Erinnerung. All you have to add is Träumer and Gedanken, Amber with Jung. Just a brief point, if I may, to conclude on Klagers, and again, in, inspired uh, in this respect by, by Thomas Arndt's writings. In his treatise on the cognition and sensation of the human soul, 1778, Herder, Gottfried, Johann Gottfried Herder writes, every noble human nature sleeps like all good seed in the quiet germ. It's present and does not recognize itself. Whence does the poor germ know and whence should it know what irritations, forces, vapors of life flowed upon it at the moment of its becoming? God's seal, the cover of creation, rests upon it. It was formed at the center of the earth. And, and I think that this is what Klagers is trying to argue along similar lines, that there is slumbering for centuries something vital that's trying to burst forth into the present. What unleashed itself in us, he says, is a fire that was sleeping perhaps for, for millennia, as the warmth of ashes in the enclosed oven heat in provincial mustiness. We expressed what to the sound of, of crickets chirping, to the aromatic breath of the baking oven, what to the whistling in the chimney on a stormy autumnal night in plowing and sowing great-grandfathers hardly became conscious as a childish fever. There was a feeling and an impulse in us that unconsciously flowed in their blood. And of course, this whole rhetoric around blood, which is so complicated and, and so difficult, is, I think, a key idea that links Klagers and Jung together. I'm going to make a short commercial break as we're halfway through. And... Um, to draw your attention to the fact that there is a book, if you'd like to know about Ludwig Klages, um, uh, called Ludwig Klages and the Philosophy of Life, a vitalist toolkit. Um, I like to think that it's the, the best book about Klages in English, uh, but that's only because it's the only book about Klages uh, in English. You, you can find Klages in, in translation, by the way, um, in books by Arctos. I would say, don't buy them by mine, but, but there's a serious point about Arctos. Unfortunately, it's a right-wing publishing house, and it's one of the big complications with Klagers that they are publishing him, and, and it doesn't do his reputation any good at, at all. So anyway, um, happy to talk about that more when it comes to questions. Okay, that's enough of the commercial break. The second figure that I would like to look at is Theodor Adorno. Now, according to Anthony Storr, um, and I had a great privilege of knowing Anthony Storr when he was uh, at Oxford, and um, he was uh, he was very kind to me, very, very supportive, um, as, as have 
people in the audience like uh, like Murray have been with me throughout the years. Um, I really do appreciate it. Anthony Storr writes that Jung once told him that with dreams, there's always a chance of the Eucharist every night. And he says uh, that uh, when he was at Aeronos, when Jung came down to the breakfast in the morning, if he'd experienced the night before a dream, all the other delegates would gather around to hear it like a revelation. Um, well, this practice would have displeased Walter Benjamin, who in One Way Street, Einbeinstrasse of 1928, warns against recounting one's dreams in the morning on an empty stomach. You shouldn't do that, says, uh, uh, says Benjamin. Get your breakfast in you, uh, in you first. But I think the more important point is that, that Benjamin is actually very interested in dreams. Um, and he thinks dreaming is significant as long as you've had your breakfast uh, uh, beforehand. And it's not just Walter Benjamin. In fact, the whole Frankfurt School is far more interested in dreams, was far more interested in dreams than one might expect. And I think this became clear when in uh, 2005, Zorkamp Verlag published extracts on the, the dream protocols of Theodor V. Adorno. And it seems that um, Adorno ignored Benjamin's advice. And he would write down his dreams on waking up, and his wife, Gretel Adorno, would then make fair copies of them. Adorno would sometimes then make changes, add some explanations, but more often than that, he didn't, and the dream protocol was simply allowed to stand. Of these dreams, the dream protocols published in 2005 contain a much wider, if still incomplete, selection. So there's always something extra. After the, there's the red book, there's the black book, after the black book, there's, there's transcripts. So it is, I think, the dream protocols, except there's no illustrations in the case of the book. So again, let me just share with you what's, um, what, what are in these protocols. Not surprisingly, given Adorno's erudition, there are educational dreams. For example, he dreams of, I was due to sit an exam, an oral exam in, in geography. Um, or I had to write a six hour long school essay on Goethe. Uh, then again, there are dreams involving wordplay, um, where there's there's a, a kind of Wortspiel, which is uh, which is which is a play, um, and there are also dreams which I think one could say are frankly erotic, an awful lot of them. Um, but I know that you're an analyst, so you won't mind me sharing some of these with you. For example, he dreams of a ship boarded by pirates and women, two of whom began to undress. Uh, a, a dream of a visit to an American brothel. Um, a dream of visiting Anatole France, um, the French writer, in the course of which the French writer changes into a young, highly seductive woman with provocative breasts, which press hard against the V-shaped neckline of her black lace dress and long black silk stockings, in response to which Adorno kissed the top of her breasts, her mouth, played with her legs, and it was settled from now on that she would become my mistress. And all of this is um, a, a dawner. Dreams of a kind of masochistic brothel that morphs into a martyrdom scene. I'll come to that. Um, and one of the things one notices about this, uh, this imagination uh, is that in many ways it's, it's, it's remarkably uh, a bourgeois. Um, but anyway, um, I, I, I won't go uh, insist too much on that. I'll move to another strange dream. Um, uh, which I'll share with you, I've actually put the text up for you there. After that, there was a great celebratory ball. I danced with a giant yellowish brown Great Dane. He walked on his hind legs and wore evening dress. I submitted entirely to the dog and to the man with no gift for dancing. I had the feeling that I was able to dance for the first time in my life secure and without inhibition. Occasionally we kissed, the dog and I. Woke up feeling extremely satisfied. <laughs> that really is, that really is a dawn. I, enough of that little gift that goes on a bit, doesn't it? So I'll move on to something else. Um, one dream in 19, January 1942. Adorno is approached by a group of extraordinarily beautiful women 
with crocodile heads that intend to devour him. One of these women assures Adorno that being eaten didn't uh, hurt. Um, uh, and, and it's interesting, there's a whole nexus of images, I know that isn't a crocodile, but uh, to do with um, crocodiles or dinosaurs. Um, I, I'll leave, move from the crocodile women and onto the fascination with dinosaurs. Uh, in a dream in 1954, Adorno felt that he could feel his veins swelling and hardening to bursting point. And then he sees the following. Some kind of disgusting little animals were creating havoc. A toy-sized triceratops appeared so as to introduce order, but nothing happened, and he finally became indistinguishable from the little animals. In 1955, he has a dream of two giant black triceratops as if made of plastic, furious, horrifying animals. Now, I don't know of any passages where Jung talks about dinosaurs, but I do know, of course, that the black snake plays a crucial part in the fantasies or visions of the, uh, of the Red Bull. And of course, in his seminars on dream analysis of 1928 to 1930, Jung explains that these cold-blooded relics, he's talking about snakes, crocodiles, and so on, are in a way uncanny powers because they symbolize the fundamental factors of our uh, instinctive life dating from Paleozoic times. So whenever life means business, when things are getting serious, you are likely to find a dinosaur in the way. Uh, he says the whole function of the saurian or the dinosaur is to light the contents of the unconscious in a way that enables us to move forward. Well, there really is a lot one can say about it. And I hope in the, the written version of the paper to try and flesh this out in a bit more detail. But I think there are extraordinarily striking affinities between Adorno and, um, and the Red Book. Uh, first of all, we have this idea of sequentiality and the interconnectedness of, of dreams. And certain patterns, recurring motifs can be found in the dream protocols, just as the Red Book itself clearly illustrates Jung's view that dreams and visions are not to be considered in isolation, but in terms of the dynamism of the, of the sequence of which they form part. Secondly, some of the dreams mentioned in the protocols were incorporated into other works. Uh, a dream in 1943 about giving some, some useful, something useful to the banker and economist Albert Hahn, which turns out to be a guide to the kingdom of the dead. I think about, we already talked about that with Christine's uh, paper this morning. Uh, this note, these notes find their way into the section called monograms in Minima Moralia, just in the way that some of the mandalas featured in the Red Book were then presented elsewhere in other works as, work, as, as mandalas produced by by clients. Thirdly, there's some quite fascinating specific parallels. Um, I just want to mention a few of them, uh, notably the figure of Siegfried, with all its mythological, and in the case particularly of Adorno, its Wagnerian interactions. Um, when Adorno was working on his study in search of Wagner, staying in London in 1937, uh, he had a dream about Siegfried. Um, dressed in half mythological, half modern clothes. Um, and um, he finds a figure in a riding dress who is his, um, uh, who is his adversary. Brunhilde appears in the background in the shape of the Statue of Liberty in New York, screaming, I want a ring, give me a beautiful ring. And that was how Siegfried obtained the ring of the Nibelung. Curious dream, but clearly all the mythological motives are there. As they, did, as they are in Jung's famous vision of Siegfried as recorded uh, in the Red Book. And I'm also reminded um, in the, the dream that Adorno has strikes me as very reminiscent of the moment in the Red Book when Jung becomes caught up in the Good Friday ceremonial from Parsifal. And he's, he's half uh, in old clothes, half in modern clothes as well. And it's a very significant episode because, of course, um, in Mysterium Conjunctionis, writing of the images that emerge during analysis, Jung tells us that so long as the modern individual simply looks at the pictures, he's like the foolish Parsifal, who forgot to ask the vital question because he was not aware of his own participation in the action. So there's a, a fascinating nexus here, I think. Um, more specific examples, um, the Kabiri, well, we know the Kabiri in the, uh, in the tower uh, section, building the tower. Um, they're also there in, um, in Adorno's dreams. Um, 
he has a dream um, in, in Locarno, actually, in 19, uh, 1954, about what he calls a kind of masochist brothel. I was in a pub um, and he has, he says, the place was full of monstrosities and extremely tiny dwarves. These monstrosities walked around on legs like lobsters, trying to attack people's genitals. Another very strange, highly sexualized uh, dream. Um, this, uh, this dream, uh, during which a nightclub hostess grabs Adorno through his trousers, concludes with a large number of silent, shadowy people whom, Jung regard, uh, whom Adorno regards with superficial calm. They won't do anything for me, but underlying disquiet, even greater fear, fear of their own reality. Um, I've already talked about the, uh, the presence of the dead um, as being a factor in uh, Adorno. Um, there's also a, a number of dreams which involve Adorno's execution and specifically his crucifixion. Uh, and of course, we know the crucifixion scenes in the way of the cross, black serpent creeping into the body of the crucified, emerging again from his, from his mouth. Um, well, it's interesting to compare that with young uh, Adorno's dream of 1942, uh, which goes like this. I dreamt I was to be crucified. The crucifixion was to take place at the Bockenheim of Varta, just by the university. I felt no fear at all. In 1944, he dreamed I was to be executed like Pierre Boulounaire. Um, he has an execu has executions, of, uh, fantasies involving beheading, dreams of other people um, uh, being executed, and a very disturbing dream, indeed, the dream of a child being handed over to Adorno for him to torture. Finally, and, and less grimly, there is the Mandala type of dream, um, which uh, Dorno has in 1945, looking out of a bay window in southern Germany onto a marketplace, and he sees a sky which is a deep greeny blue, which contains a myriad little shining stars in which a constellation then forms, consisting of larger and brighter stars. The entire thing, he says, could have lasted no more than a second, the dream made me feel exceedingly happy. It was highly colorful. And I think that um, there's a larger story to be told here, um, but not today. You'll be grateful to know here about the idea of nature as it's seen from the left and the Frankfurt School and this primordial sense of nature that we've seen uh, in Jung and Klager's. Um, and I think this is really the area where the Frankfurt School and analytical psychology have a lot to talk about, um, if only the Frankfurt School folk would uh, be open to doing so. So I think across this intellectual and political spectrum, from uh, Klager's on the right to Adorno on the left, we could describe them as searchers for the soul as well. I just want to conclude um, uh, with this uh, passage uh, taken from uh, the section called Princess Lizard. There are our lizardy friends again, Prince of Lizard in Minima and Moralia. Um, those who are rooted envy the nomads, he says. Um, the search for green pastures. And the green wagon is uh, the home on wheels whose course follows the stars. What is so... Um, what is soulless in those who, at the borders of culture, a daily forbidden self-determination, charm and torture at the same time, turns into a phantasmagoria of the soul for the well-heeled who have learned from culture to be ashamed of the soul. Then dipping down to the end of the passage, in the end, the soul is itself, the longing of the soulless for salvation. And I think you can see there is a very consistent pattern here, Adorno, Young targers as searchers for the soul. And perhaps that's not surprising because second popular cultural reference just to annoy Adorno, after all, uh, as we know from Tracy Chapman, all you have is your soul.